Is this? Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to my talk. My name is Dan Persha, and I'm working for Zalando as a software engineer. Today, I'll be talking about how we scale our tech organization and architecture. Why is my talk today interesting for you? First of all, if you're a developer, you're writing some code, you're also implementing lots of features, sp spending also some time in the meetings. At the end of the day, you feel like you did lots of stuff, but you're not completely satisfied. You feel that there is something missing. You're, you feel that you're not quite happy. By taking a look at the changes we did in our company, you might find out what that missing thing is. Also, you might, might have a better idea what to look for when you're searching for your next job. Why does this matter? Why does it matter to be happy at work, both for developers and for companies? And this is simple. A happy team is a productive team. That's when the innovation starts to happen. On the other hand, if you're not a developer, but you're representing a company which wants to establish itself as a tech company, wants to expand its tech team, wants to hire more talented engineers, and wants to have a more productive team. And somehow, this is not happening. The existing team is not productive enough. The features take ages to implement, and it's really hard to hire more developers for different reasons. The candidates who apply are not good enough. The candidates who fit don't accept your offer. Or even broader reasons, there are not enough engineers in the industry, so it's impossible to find the good ones and expand your business. None of these reasons are good reasons, of course. There are lots of engineers out there, but they are just, just not joining your company. They are joining other companies. What you might learn today is how to make your company more appealing to developers, how to attract them, keep them happy and productive. Some words about Zalando. We are Europe's leading online fashion platform. We are present in 15 countries, and we have more than 18 million active customers. Last year, we have a 3 billion euro revenue, and we have more than 10,000 employees. We also have lots of traffic on our shop. You might be familiar with it already, as Zalando is pretty well known in Germany. We are a quite big company. But who knows Zalando technology? Zalando as a company is quite big. I just mentioned 10,000 employees. But today, we'll focus only on Zalando tech. Here is how Zalando Tech is spread in Europe. In Germany, we have the headquarters in Berlin and other smaller offices in cities like Dortmund or Hamburg. Last year, we opened two new tech hubs outside of Germany, in Dublin and in Helsinki, and we want to expand even more this year. Here is a picture of how our tech department is structured. Of course, the picture is really simplified. On top, you can see that we, are, we have several sales channels, like shop, mobile, lounge, and several services connected to each other. On the technical side, today we'll mostly talk about the shop, as this is a, an e-commerce conference. To give you an impression about the complexity and the size of our tech department, let's check this graph out. Here's how our tech department evolved over time. As you can see, we started in 2008 with PHP and MySQL, Magento, of course. And in the meanwhile, we evolved our technology stack. Now we are using more programming languages. More programming, yeah. One of my colleagues created this graph last year to demonstrate the growth of our applications in comparison with our tech team. This year, this graph had to be slightly adjusted. As you can see, the numbers of apps just exploded. Now we have more than 500. We have 250 open source GitHub repositories. And I'll talk about our open source strategy a little bit later. Of course, plenty of our apps are still closed source. So looking at these numbers, you might ask yourself, how can this be possible? The answer is simple. One year ago, we introduced radical agility. 
Radical agility is a way of running your business based on purpose, autonomy, and mastery. To describe this in one sentence would be trust instead of control. Yesterday there was a talk by Skylight and they have a similar but slightly different approach. The final goals of radical agility are being represented on the edges of the slide, and this is increasing innovation and increasing productivity. I won't go into more theoretical details about radical agility, as I have colleagues already doing tech talks completely dedicated to this subject. What's important for my talk today is that radical agility changed the communication structure of our tech department. We started to be organized into small, autonomous engineering teams, which are trusted and accept responsibility. And, as a consequence of Conway's law, which says that organizations produce designs which are copies of their internal communication structure, our architecture also had to be changed. Just think about this again. I just said that we did some changes in our tech department, and those changes generated a change in our architecture. Isn't this reverse engineering the Conway's law? Somehow. I say somehow because we knew from the beginning that changing the internals of our teams will lead to a new architecture. So we started at both ends. We started to introduce change in our tech organization and at the same time come up with a new architecture. Today I'll talk about our success story the changes we did in both our organization and architecture. My goal of sharing this with you, with others, is that everybody can learn from it, get ideas, inspiration, so that our tech industry and e-commerce will go forward to the next level. First, let's talk about the reasons behind those changes. Why would we change something which works anyway? Zalando's existing architecture generated lots of money last year. Our business had constant growth year after year. So why change something that works? What are the goals behind all of these changes? What we want is to be able to scale our tech organization. What does that mean? We want to attract new, talented people to grow our team. We have plenty of interesting projects to build, and even though we have plenty of engineers, we need even more. Of course, this doesn't make sense if there are more engineers leaving the company than coming. So we also need to keep our existing teams happy. We want diverse people who are able to see the same problem for, from different perspectives. The more ideas we have, the more likely it is to find the best one. Diversity leads to innovation. We also want to actively encourage innovation. A happy team is an innovative team. For a happy, innovative team, it's easy to talk about what they are doing and attract new, talented people. As you can see, all of these four points are correlated. As I said, one of our goals is to attract new talent. We want to build the greatest tech team on Earth. And that's a tough challenge. How do you do this? What's the first thing you, you do when you want to hire more people? Well, changing the recruitment process would be a great step. Here, offering fast feedback to the candidates is crucial. You have to be aware that if you're interested in to hire somebody, uh, you can bet that there are other companies also interested in the same person. You need to give really fast feedback to the candidates. We used to have a slow recruitment process, now, after changing it, we have a two weeks on average from screening to offer. How is our hiring process organized now? There is a screening interview made by recruiters and then a few inspiring conversations with the people who, that do the job the candidate is applying for. Any developer can register as an interviewer. There, are short, there is a short training before starting to do interviews, of course. One rule we have is that recruiters can overread the interviewer's calendar, at least theoretically. Practically, everybody should be aware that hiring is a priority for the company and accept the interview appointments. To get an idea about the scale of our uh, uh, hiring, here is some numbers. So we do between 900 and 1,100 interviews each month. 
Okay, hiring works perfectly. What else? Communication is the key here. When I'm doing interviews, before the end of an interview, I'm usually asking the candidate if he or she has questions. And really often it happens that the answer is, I don't have lots of questions, I already know what you're doing, what technologies you're using, etc. My advice, make, your community, make the community aware of what your company is doing. Open source helps a lot here. You can talk about hidden things which happen in your organization. If your code is open source and somebody asks, you just say, here it is, just check out GitHub. I have a slide dedicated entirely to open source, but you'll hear about it, talking about it many times today, as open source is not only helpful to attract talent, but on also other things. As a tech person, there are many ways to get involved into making the communication for your company better. And here are some ways. Submit a talk proposal for a conference or an event. Suggest your company as a venue for the meetup. Share stories, projects with the tech community. If you don't have a tech blog, start writing articles and build one. OK, we talked about attracting new talent. It's also important to keep the existing teams happy. How do you do that? The answer is simple. You organize a hack week. During hack week, everybody stops their usual daily activity and starts working on a project of their choice. The goal here is to pull together people who never worked together before. Some are in different parts of the business, some are in, are in different offices. Our last hack week, last December, had 900 participants. We had more than 100 projects, one, more than 100 nationalities, and of course, 12 awards. During the hack week, the company facilitated the movement of people between all of the offices we have. Hack week also encourages innovation, as lots of interesting ideas have been born during this time. With Tech Academy, we want to enable our techies to learn continuously from each other or from non-Zalando experts. We want to share and spread knowledge. Ever wanted to train people? If you're working for Zalando, you just join Tech Academy and do it. Developers need a safe place to practice, to play with code and designs without the pressure of the everyday work. Coder Dojo are also a great way to share knowledge and learn in a fun way. Last year, we organized free coder dojos with different subjects like RESTful API design or test-driven development. Each month, we have a whole calendar with events, internal or external uh, tech talks, coder dojos. We have a closure mentoring, a Scala study group, a Haskell study group, and of course, gaming nights and parties are not missing. That's a picture I took last week from the wall where we draw our Enjoy Tech calendar. As you can see, there are plenty of events there. Last but not least, and I said I'll be mentioning this again, encourage open source in your company. It seems that there is a direct correlation between team happiness and working on open source projects. One last tip, how do you measure team happiness? That's kind of a tricky question, but the answer is simple. Just go there and ask. Do a survey with a question, how happy you are. Measure that every month and you see, and in the end you'll get a graph to see it improving or going down. Happiness is a relative thing, of course. Diversity leads to innovation, as I said. Creating diversity is another one of our goals. At Zalando, we strive for an open and creative culture to drive more innovation and deliver stronger business results. Zalando technologists come from 72 countries around the world. We are all different, but we are all Zalandos. Talking about innovation, we actively encourage it. How do we do that? As I, as I promise, there is a slide about open source. Open source is a great thing and it's part of the radical agility principles. 
it dramatically increases the quality of the code and it encourages us to build software as independent products and offer it to others. It attracts talent, it's fun, and make, makes us proud as developers. Just think for a, mo for a moment, what do all of the great projects ha have in common? For these great projects, people work for free with passion, spending their free time developing, shaping the future of it. A great example would be the Linux kernel. Also, I see lots of frameworks around here which are open source. For uh, the thing which all of these projects have in common, of course, is that they are all open source. That's how you attract the most talented people in the world. We developed our own in-house dashboard for open source projects as we have a lot of them, around 250 open source repositories in GitHub. So using our dashboard, it's easy to see our project in a more structured way. We also have our open source guild, which meets and discuss, shape and grow the Zalando.txt open source culture and reputation. We have people who are specifically trying to make open source uh, better uh, and uh, more often at Zalando. So here are some of our open source principles. Do open source first. If your Zalando project can be offered to non-Zalandos, release it as open source from the start. Share your code. All of the code share between the teams must be open source. This addresses also the problem of having code duplication in between the teams. Be safe. To ensure the broadest possible use of your project, use MIT license. And I just, uh, in the previous talk, saw that the previous framework was also under MIT license. Deliver quality. Provide a great out-of-the-box experience. Don't have hidden dependencies in your project. The Slingshot program is another tool for driving innovation. What's practically, practically happening here is that if, you, if one of our tech colleagues has an idea, he or she can pitch it in, form of, uh, in front of a jury and the jury decides at the end which are the winning ideas. The pitching is organized every three months. If you're one of the winners, you're able to use 20% of your time, of your working time during this three uh, months on implementing that idea which you had. If you don't have a winning idea, don't worry. You just are able to join one of the winning projects and still spend 20% of your time working for an idea. Onboarding new people. First impression matters. We'd like our new colleagues to have a good first impression about our company. That's one of the reasons we are smoothly introducing them into our culture, our tools, our way of doing things. Every new colleague has one full month of onboarding. Onboarding drives innovation by encouraging the newbies to work on different projects during this first month, including open source projects. From what I described, you can understand that we do lots of events, we learn a lot, we share our knowledge, we try to innovate. But what about productivity? I said that a happy team is a productive team, but that's not enough. We have tools to keep us productive. Tech Constitution is one of those tools. We want every Zalando person to know and understand his or her rights and responsibilities, as well as the rights and responsibilities of their leaders and the rights and responsibilities of the tech team as a whole. Some of our guideline principles are trust instead of control, also, there is the right to build a personal brand related to work and the right to make informed decisions. As developers, we understand the great importance of feedback. Feedback is part of our everyday routine. We write acceptance tests to get feedback about uh, the features we develop. We write unit tests to ha have feedback about our code. We do retrospective meetings to get feedback about our processes. We release software one uh, every once or two weeks or 
well, even better, continuous delivery to get feedback from our stakeholders. We deeply understand the importance of a really fast feedback loop. We want our tests to be really fast. We also want our sprints to be really small. Feedback is as important for software as it is for our other colleagues. In order to be successful as a company, you have to have an open feedback culture. And of course, a face-to-face -face feedback is the best feedback. We encourage people to give feedback to each other as often as possible. We are also trying to formalize the feedback process by building a feedback tool. We developed a prototype at the end of last year, and the team who built it asked the whole company for feedback about it, improved it, and now we are running the second prototype. OKRs, so objectives and key results. OKRs are a hierarchical way of defining objectives, as you can see in our example. So we have the company OKR, some department OKRs maybe, and some team OKRs. Okay, a part of the OKRs is to make sure that each individual knows what's expected from them at work. Teams themselves define their OKRs, taking into account the OKRs above them, as well as the OKRs of the other teams. OKRs are always kept public in front of everyone so that the teams move into one direction and know what others are focusing on. We talked about scaling our tech team and how we maintain productivity. My next chapter of my talk is about the architecture scalability. What we want to achieve here? We want many teams working on different features in parallel without interfering with each other. We want team autonomy. Team autonomy is guaranteed by our tech constitution. We want programming language diversity. We want to use the right tool for the job. We used to be a Java-based company, and now we are putting more and more language in production. Adding and removing features really fast drives the product forward. Experimenting with feature is a great way to innovate and improve on the product side. As I'm part of the fashion store department, and as it's a, an e-commerce company, I will concentrate on our fashion store architecture today. Nowadays, if you have any questions about software architecture, there is only one answer, microservices. One year ago, we started to migrate our monoliths to microservices. Every company with a code base older than a few years has a monolith. SoundCloud calls their monolith the mothership. We call it Jimmy. As I said, we started migrating Jimmy one year ago. Right now, we migrated the, best, uh, the biggest feature we have in our fashion store, the checkout. But there are still lots of other features to be extracted out of Jimmy. In Jimmy, we have thousands of Java classes, features, and business logic on all of the layers, including the database. A year ago, or a few years ago, we used to be a big shop team. Now we have many small ones, and we want to add even more teams. It's obvious for us that going forward with Jimmy is not possible, as we are not able to scale the number of teams and allow the things which radical agility promises to be autonomous and independent. Our goal was from the beginning to come up with a state-of-the-art architecture that enables autonomy and fosters innovation. That's how Project Mosaic was born. The goals of the project was to, well, get rid of Jimmy, enable team autonomy, also, we want to have a consistent user experience. We want our customers to feel that our shop is built by one big team and not by dozens of small ones. We also want rapid feature development, continuous deployment. We want to establish best practices for all of the teams who are uh, creating the shop. And we also want a tech stack update. Here is how our architecture looks like. We have a fleet of skippers in the beginning. Skipper is our router, a piece of software we built, open source, of course, which is the entry point for every request from the browser. 
excluding the stacked resources. Skipper acts as a reverse proxy and will delegate the request based on some internal routes to one of our microservices or to Jimmy on the duration on which we do the migration. As I said, we have a fleet of Skipper instances, and it's important for all of them to have the same routes at the same time. It's the role of Inkeeper, another microservice, to do this. Next, we have Taylor and Kilt. Taylor is our layout service, who's calling other microservices, which provide HTML markup. We call those microservices fragments. And what Taylor does is putting everything together and giving, is giving back a response. So let's see how this works with a practical example. So here we have a request for Zalando D slash card from Skipper. Uh, Skipper knows that the, this URL should be handled by Taylor, our layout service, and forwards the request to it. Taylor needs a template for the slash card URL. And if it doesn't have it already there cached, it asks Quilt for it, another microservice. Taylor gets the template, looks at it, and sees that it has to call a header fragment, a car fragment, and a tracking fragment. Does all of those calls, puts everything together, and returns a response to Skipper back. And in order to have a high user perceived performance, it streams everything. As soon as it has something from the other microservices, it starts uh, uh, transmitting uh, the response back to the browser. So the user doesn't have any delay into getting the response. The fragments are microservices developed by the teams inside of the fashion store. Teams should be able to work at, deploy at, the, and uh, deliver these microservices independent of each other. So what's happening inside of a fragment? We can render HTML for Taylor, we can return Ajax request for Skipper, a Skipper can call fragments directly, and it, we can do internal API calls to other RESTful APIs. Of course, none of these actions are required. You can choose only to render some static HTML in a fragment. Fragments solve half of the problem, the browser-facing part. How do we solve the backend problem? Is this a software architecture problem? The answer is simple, with more microservices, of course. And in this case, RESTful APIs. We at Zalando prefer systems to be really RESTful, not just JSON RPC, since the goals of REST are the same as our goals to build interoperating distributed systems that can be evolved in parallel by different teams while still continuing to work. Our APIs need to last for a long time. APIs can only be evolved in certain ways, and bigger changes are hard and expensive. We want our APIs to be uh, designed outside of the code and reviewed by peers before we start implementing them. One of the reasons the API uh, of this API first approach is to decouple APIs from technologies. Each team can choose its own technology tech, they can choose their own programming languages. The common ground for communication in between teams are our APIs. Of course, we use our APIs for communication outside of the team also. Fragments and RESTful APIs solve the problem of having many teams working in parallel at different features without interfering with each other. We also solve the problem of language diversity. Of course, none of these make sense if you're not able to deploy really fast. We need a way to deploy easily our application. And well, here we have the cloud. The cloud comes to the rescue. We use Stoops an open source toolkit we developed in-house to be able to deploy on AWS with ease. As Zalando is a public company, it's really important that Stoops is audit compliant. Migrating to microservices is not easy. It's actually a big effort and a big investment. We started to migrate our fashion store one year ago. Since then, the teams didn't deliver lots of new features as they were busy with the migration. And because of that, our product, our product 
people are not so happy. We still have a lot of things to finish, and here is our roadmap. Of course, the productivity boost we'll have after the migration, as we'll be able to parallelize concerns and features, will make up for the whole lost time. As a conclusion to my talk, I'd like to answer one more question. We did lots of changes in our organization. We strive to migrate to microservices. And this, are these changes in our organization and architecture giving any results? And I would say yes. Here are some numbers to back this up. In February 2015, we were able to hire 13 people in tech, in March 25. This year, we hired 54 people and, uh, uh, in February and 61 uh, in March. As you can see, the numbers are more than double. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any questions? Hi. Um, as you're talking about a success story at Zalando, um, I would also be interested in to the failures that you made. So because I couldn't imagine that this perfect world that you just draw just fall from the sky. But what happened in between and what went wrong? Well, I guess that's a subject of another tech talk. But what I can say is that we failed a lot. So as I said, radical agility says that you should trust instead of control. So in case one of our team fails to do something, what we want to achieve is to learn from that failure. And we, have, we had plenty of them. Of course, I can't talk about it right now as I'm not prepared and I don't know of all of our failures. But what I can tell is that we fail lots of times and always try to learn from those failures and try to go forward. Hi, you said that you're organizing uh, hack weeks. Uh, how do they look? Uh, is it uh, the whole week or just one day? And it is a whole week. It's called hack week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and do you take, take off all, all the people from, from development? The, of all, the all of the people from tech, so the whole tech, including product uh, guys and uh, producers, everybody who works in tech uh, is, is able to participate. Okay, and uh, how, how many events you organize? So first? we have one hack week per year. So we started with two, but it seemed a little bit too much. So <laughs> then we went to one hack week per year. But uh, we are organizing more coder dojos, which are more based on uh, one day thing or half of a day thing. Okay, so one, one week per year sounds reasonable. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? There is somebody here. Uh, I don't really hear you. Uh, please take the mic. Can you uh, tell us a few words about, uh, more words about Skipper? Many people at this conference use varnish in this place, and uh, I think you're using something homegrown. Is it also uh, an open source project you use there? And uh, how does it compare to varnish, for example? So I don't know exactly what varnish is, but I can talk about Skipper. Yeah. So Skipper is a reverse proxy we developed as open source software in-house. It's written in Go, and it's really performant. So as all of the requests uh, from the browser goes through the skipper, skipper has to be really, really performant. And that was our goal from the beginning. So we are one of the companies in Europe which gets the biggest number of requests. And that's why uh, this component had to be uh, really performant. We, in the beginning, before starting developing it, we tried some other open source solutions, but none of them were able to cover all of our use cases. And that's why we decided to uh, write something in-house. 
So it's open source, just uh, check our GitHub account and see how it works. There is uh, plenty of documentation there and how to use it. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, what you're doing with Jimmy sort of sounds like a rewrite, um, the, the, the effect. Why did you use a sort of refactoring uh, approach rather than a real rewrite? So what we want is to have, as I said, to have many teams being able to independently deploy their components. With Jimmy, this is not possible. Also, we want to get rid of all of the undocumented features we want in Jimmy. Right now, nobody is responsible for those kind of hidden features as nobody is aware of them. So we want, at some point, after we migrate feature after feature, to find those features and somehow get rid of them or uh, have a team to take responsibility for those features. Does this answer your question? Well, not, not quite, um, because you could have uh, basically taken the resources and, and rewritten it from scratch. Why, why do a migration? We don't want to have any downtime, so we have to be always online. It, it is impossible for, it's like not a thing for us to lose any requests, because, well, losing requests mean lo means losing money. So we can't afford having not even one second of downtime. We want uh, our system to be always online, and that's why we are slowly migrating each feature out of Jimmy. Okay, so thank you a lot, and yeah.